I'm glad everybody could join us today uh, on the call. We've got the Full Fuels Institute team uh, to work on any any questions. Uh, we've got Marjorie, Amanda, Kelly, and then of course our speaker, John Eichberger, uh, who is going to be presenting for about 45 minutes. And then we're gonna roll into some Q&A. We're gonna try to get to all the questions, but of course, we've got uh, a very large number of attendees here. Again, thank you very much for joining. Um, for those questions that we can't get to, we're gonna we'll make note and we'll we'll include those uh, with a response afterwards. This session is being recorded, and you'll get uh, all attendees will get a link to the recording sometime next week, as soon as we can do uh, pull it, pull it all together and, and get something nice and clean to everybody. Um, so for your questions, there's the chat option up above. Uh, feel free to throw your questions in there, and then during the Q and A. Um, um, if we if we want to use the raise the hand thing, we can we can do that as well. Otherwise, staff will just start, you know, we'll go through the, the questions and hit as many as we can. Um, so. The life cycle analysis from the Fuels Institute really is, is, is really timely, of course, and John and I had the, had the opportunity to work with EPA on their mobile source. Uh, the MSTRS group late last year, and what came out of that discussion was an obvious need to look towards performance standards uh, from not just a tailpipe emissions, but of course the life, the whole life cycle analysis of the of the vehicle uh, as we move forward here. So, uh, very excited about this report that came out. And without further ado, I'm going to pass the mic over to Mr. Eichberger and take it away, sir. Thanks, Jeff, and everybody, thank you guys very much for joining us today. Um, I'm going to share my slides here. Uh, the plan today is I'm going to give a high-level overview of the findings, um, kind of what we our takeaway from it is and um, what we think is most important, where it leads us going into the uh, continued discussion on decarbonizing the transportation space. Ruth Latham, the principal with Ricardo Strategic Consulting, who kind of quarterbacked this project on behalf of the Fuels Institute, is on the line as well. Um, she'll introduce herself in a couple minutes, and then she's going to join me for Q and A because my guess is there's going to be questions I can't answer, and uh, I've asked Ruth to come on and help uh, answer some of those questions, especially particularly regarding methodology inputs considerations that the Ricardo team brought into this project. <clears throat> um, quick caveat: when we start talking about life cycle analysis, that can be a very charged discussion, and there are some very strong opinions. Um, I think what's most important before I even get started on the slides is the Fuels Institute did not set out to create a whole new LCA and uh, assessment or to close a door on all discussions. What we wanted to do was create a benchmark and a baseline from which we can have discussions about how we progress on a decarbonization path for the transportation space. So <clears throat> clearly everybody has different inputs and all models and analyses are subject to the inputs and, ass and assumptions made at the beginning. So we'll walk through some of those, but keep in mind this is, was a paper designed to inform discussion, prompt more discussion to help lead us down the path towards uh, better strategies for reducing emissions. I wanna start off for those of you who are not familiar with the Fuels Institute, We've been around nine years now. It seems like just yesterday that we started, uh, but we are a nonprofit, non-advocacy uh, organization. Our, our goal, our mission is to research uh, energy for transportation purposes. The term fuel in our name refers to all energy. We study electricity, hydrogen, natural gas, liquid fuels, you name it. If it's a power source that can propel surface transportation, we're studying it. Um, all of our research is peer reviewed. Our board is close to 60 uh, people strong. They set the agenda for the, for the Fuels Institute. They review all the research to make sure it is as objective and fact based as possible. Um, and we've really built a very diverse organization, added another seven board members just last week to enhance our diversity even further. Um, this approach, not being an advocacy group and trying to have a diverse collaborative approach, really does help us bring some objective perspective to the discussions. Um, <clears throat> since we do not try to push an outcome, all we want to do is provide information and provide some knowledge and some uh, fodder for discussion and deliberation. I mentioned our board. This is a quick snapshot of who is on our board. Um, 
it's important to note that the stakeholders on our board come to the Fuels Institute not to defend their business, not to defend their turf, but really to have a better understanding where the market's heading. And each org, each individual who represents our companies on our board has come to it with this future-looking perspective. Um, and that really helps us drive an agenda that is constructive and collaborative and supportive of the market. The disclaimer at the bottom here is I'm not speaking on behalf of any of our board members, any of our contributors, or any of our partners. I'm speaking on behalf of the research that the Fuel Institute has commissioned and any uh, commentary, especially any snide comments or jokes I might make are 100% my fault and should not reflect on the uh, reputation or the position of any of our board members. <clears throat> The life cycle paper came out in January of this year, and this is a quick overview, but basically we said there's so much discussion, and I've, I do 40 to 50 presentations a year, most of them these days on electrification. Questions I get are, well, electric vehicles, are they really cleaner? Um, why are they pushing them? Uh, internal combustion engines, are can they be cleaner? What is the real balance here? And so we reached out to Ricardo Strategic Consulting. Um, we actually had about six or seven companies bid on it. Their proposal was the strongest. The board selected them. And we asked them, we want to take a look at what is, where are we? What is the balance? What is the uh, environmental performance of combustion engine, hybrid vehicles, and battery electric vehicles so that we can have that dialogue about where we go next? So with that, I'm going to ask Ruth to uh, join us and kind of walk us through a little bit who Ricardo is and kind of their mindset as they endeavored on this project. And then I'll come back and start going over some of the results. Ruth? Yeah, absolutely. So Ricardo is a 100-year-old engineering consultancy. We're probably best known for our work in engines and powertrain, um, but we we are a multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary group um, with, with global reach, um, and we work primarily in the automotive sector, but with some um, other activities in energy and the environment. Um, we're split primarily in two teams. We have the technical consulting group, which um, does, you know, like actually designing systems um, and has strategic consulting, which is the team that I'm in. Our, our team deals with everything that is at the intersection of technology and policy and cost. So we work, you know, where all of those things intersect. Um, and then we also do some niche manufacturing. Uh, one of the other things we're known for is manufacturing the engine for the McLaren. And so these are all the areas that we work in. Um, again, the strategic consulting team is focused on, um, on that intersection area with technology and policy, but um, we do also have an energy and environment team that does a significant amount of life cycle analysis. Um, our goal for this study was not to come up with the best way to do life cycle analysis. It was to understand what was available um, and what, what can be used today to do a, an appropriate life cycle analysis on a vehicle and how sensitive is that to the the user's assumptions that they put in um, and i think that that in doing that um, i think we came with some interesting results thanks ruth and so um, some people may ask, and John, the future is electrification. Why are we even talking about internal combustion engines? This is a, an analysis we did, and we actually submitted it to EPA last year as well. Basically, take a look at the dark blue. If Bloomberg New Energy Finance had forecast that by 2040, 60% of all vehicles sold in the U.S. would be electric. Um, if that were the case, and you know, we can quibble whether or not that is a practical forecast, whether it's feasible, whether it's not, whether it's too slow, or whether it's too fast. But let's say it's true, and if, if we have a assume a linear progression, which we know is not going to be, but for modeling, we did linear. How many vehicles would turn over in that time frame? And if you assume a consistent sale of 16 to 17 million vehicles a year, scrappage of five and a half percent every year, is 60% sales by 2040 only equates to 27% of vehicles in operation. That means that by 2040, 73% of the vehicles on the road would still be combustion engine liquid fuel. So understanding the dynamic between the environmental performance of an electric vehicle, hybrid and combustion engine vehicle is very important as we start strategically thinking about how we address emissions from the transportation space. So this is some of the context we had in our, in our minds when we commissioned this research. 
And as Ruth said, we weren't we were trying to recreate the wheel on how to do LCA, um, but we wanted to look at the comprehensive approach. We want to look at from the time you start sourcing materials to build the vehicles all the way to the end of life of the vehicles. But in in addition, we want to look at the fuel, the, the energy that was powering the, the vehicles, whether it be the harvesting of materials to create batteries, produce electricity, drill for oil, refine petroleum products, uh, grow agricultural crops to get biofuels. All those inputs need to be considered in a life cycle assessment because if you don't look at every element, then you're not looking at the full picture. And we want to look at the full picture. But again, to the point that we didn't want to recreate the wheel, uh, Ricardo started off, as most of our research does, with a exhaustive literature review, looking at more than 130 papers um, and diving deep into what the study showed us. The idea was, let's take a look at some of the leading LCA papers out there on the transportation space, learn from them, find out what common assessment assumptions, common inputs were, create a model that could be replicated and then run it through the Argonne Natural Laboratories GREET model, which is considered the top of the line in terms of uh, environmental modeling and LCA modeling, run those assumptions through and see how it compares to the leading LCAs in the, in the market. And what they found is once they created this model, they were able to really get close to the benchmark. So a consistent LCA assessment with the other leading uh, reports that were out in the market already to make sure that the model we had was pretty, was calibrated appropriately. And that was important because we really wanted to also understand from that average LCA, what are the impacts of external factors <clears throat> that could influence the overall emissions profile? And you see the sensitivities here, you know, total miles driven, carbon intensity of the grid, ambient temperature, driver behavior, all these different elements, what kind of impact did they have? And we're not going to go over all of them. Some of them didn't have a whole lot of a, an effect on the end uh, results, but we're going to focus on the ones that seem to have the greatest impact on the life cycle performance of these vehicles. So let's get into some of the results now. Um, it's interesting, we published this uh, graphic early on and several colleagues of mine in the market came back to, John, there's no such thing as average. Um, but my response, we needed to have a benchmark. And so this is the LCA results from the GREET model. Um, assuming a vehicle runs 200,000 miles, which is kind of the, the target manufacturing goal. We know they don't drive that far, but assume it, it drives 200,000 miles, which is the manufacturing objective and operates within the average carbon intensity of the U.S. electricity grid. And in that situation, you see here that the battery electric vehicle, on average, delivers 41% fewer greenhouse gas emissions than the combustion engine vehicle, and the hybrid electric vehicle delivers 29% fewer greenhouse gas emissions. And again, you see it broken down here, material sourcing, manufacture the vehicle, well to tank, which is the production of the energy, production of the electricity, production of the gasoline, tank to wheel, the actual operating conditions of the vehicle, putting miles on the vehicle, and then ultimately disposable and recycling. Um, so from here, we start to say, okay, what else can we learn from this? And there's several things I think are important, but first of all, the sensitivities we studied, um, I went through and took the change in carbon emissions from the sensitivity results and calculated what impact percentage wise did these variables have? What we found is every vehicle is sensitive to external variables. One of the questions I get often is, you know, I heard battery electric vehicles don't have the same performance in cold weather. They get much fewer miles per charge than they do in warm weather. And yeah, you can see here in the purple and gray, there's about a 28% delta when you when you reduce the temperature by 10 and 20 degrees Celsius. Um, but you also see the ICE loses efficient, increases carbon emissions as well because you're losing efficiency because you're running your heater, you're running internal operations. And so there's some red herrings out there to be thrown around. But every vehicle is going to be affected by external variables. The most significant external variables that affect the electric vehicle is the grid carbon intensity. And this next slide really shows us why. Um, I wanted to understand, I mentioned when we started this, we started the paper to, to, to lead and inform future discussions about how we reduce carbon. And one of the things that struck me the most was that we have to focus our attention where it's going to have the greatest impact. In the internal combustion engine, 73% of vehicle emissions come during vehicle operation. 
when we're actually burning liquid fuels in the combustion engine to move the vehicle down the road. If we want to reduce emissions from the ICE vehicle, we need to focus there. On the battery electric vehicle, 72% of emissions come from the generation of electricity. So if we want to reduce carbon emissions from the electric, electric vehicle market, we need to focus on the utility sector. Um, it is interesting that the production and manufacture of an electric vehicle is twice, uh, two times more carbon intense than that of the internal combustion engine. That's another uh, argument that's thrown out there a lot, that it takes so much more energy to produce the vehicles. But ultimately, because it is lower uh, carbon intense to operate, you actually offset those manufacturing deltas uh, pretty quickly when you're operating the vehicle, especially if you're in a low carbon grid environment. So what I want to start with now is look at some of the sensitivities on electricity generation. Um, as I mentioned, 72% of all carbon emissions from the battery electric vehicle come from the electricity grid, and the electricity grid is not uniform. I mentioned the average data that I put out there, got a lot of feedback from colleagues saying there's no such thing as average. And here's the breakdown. Uh, using pretty recent uh, greenhouse gas emissions profiles for the different grid uh, sectors in the United States, you see the variability. The average is 442 uh, greenhouse gas grams per kilowatt hour uh, produced, but that can range from you know, 937 in one region all the way down to 254 in another region. So where we are actually operating electric vehicles and receiving electricity to power them is extremely important to the end value of their contribution to carbon emission reductions. <clears throat> And so in the sensitivity analysis, Ricardo ran three scenarios, a low carbon grid, a high carbon grid, and extremely high carbon grid. And I define these as low carbon is going to be predominantly renewable power. Think about Pacific Northwest, extremely high carbon grid going to be predominantly coal powered. Think about, you know, the coal states, West Virginia, Southwest Virginia, and the like. And this, you see a huge variability here. In a low carbon, high renewable grid, the carbon benefit of an electric vehicle compared to internal combustion engine is 73 percent much greater than the 41 percent on the national average the hybrid electric vehicle is still 30 percent cleaner but when you go into a market where the electricity grid is extremely high carbon intense that delta changes completely and the electric vehicle over 200,000 miles emits 16 percent more carbon than a combustion engine vehicle the hybrid vehicle still emits about 27 to 30 percent less carbon so when we think about deployment strategies and trying to have the greatest bang for our buck to reduce carbon, we need to think about where we're sending different vehicles and capitalize on the uh, benefits of those markets. Maybe it doesn't make sense to deploy electric vehicles to every market right now, but if we're being strategic about it, it provides some sort of motivation to get them where they're going to have the greatest impact. Um, with that, however, and I mentioned, you know, even if we get to 60% sales by 2040, 73% of vehicles going to be liquid fuel, combustion engine. How do we reduce the carbon intensity of those vehicles, both legacy and new to market vehicles? We're going to be selling carbon. We're going to be selling combustion engine vehicles for decades unless there's some sort of ban put in place. Um, I don't see that happening at the federal level. You never know. Politics change. But as of right now, there's no ban, and the transition to a zero emission vehicle market is going to take several decades. And so, how are we going to address? that big chunk of the market that's not being addressed by new technology. So we got to look at this, this combustion cycle, the tank to wheel sector, which is responsible for about three quarters of the emissions. The most viable option right now is really to use biofuels. They represent the lowest carbon liquid fuel option in the market. This is a chart from the California Resources Board showing the carbon intensity relationship of different biofuel products and different alternative fuel products compared to California gasoline, which is the benchmark at 99 um, CO2 per megajoule of energy produced. You see starch ethanol shows you quite a significant drop. This number is actually a little bit outdated, I believe. I've seen some data showing the current uh, carbon intensity of starch ethanol is much lower than what we're seeing here. You see the biomass-based diesel is sitting at a 30 uh, uh, grams uh, compared to 99 grams for California gasoline. So there's options here. There's opportunities here. And we've got another paper coming out pretty soon that looked at this, the carbon capture sequestration consortium of several ethanol plants that shows the promise of reducing the carbon intensity to 25 um, from those plants. So huge opportunities here. The challenge is when we start modeling 
the impact of biofuels in the GREEP model over 200,000 mile life cycle, the net impact is not nearly as significant as one might think. And that's because we're constrained on how much we can use, whether it be regulation or equipment compatibility, vehicle compatibility, we're limited to 10, 15% ethanol in the most, most cases, um, which really negatively impacts the ability of ethanol to reduce the carbon emissions of the transportation space. <clears throat> so you see a slight decline from the E10, which is today's standard. E15 drops you only about one over 200,000 miles. If you're using cellulose, you get a bigger bang for your buck. But I think the key lesson here is when we look at a B20, 20% biodiesel or 100% renewable diesel, the impact over the life cycle is much more pronounced. If we're really serious about reducing the carbon intensity of the liquid fuels market, we need to think about this. We need to think about how can we take advantage of the carbon benefits of biofuels in a more efficient way. And from this study, it shows that if we can increase the volume contribution of biofuels, the ability to have a positive impact on life cycle carbon is enhanced. That's going to require significant changes in regulations and equipment, and we need to think about that. But rather than getting into a we don't want to, we shouldn't, we really should be thinking about it because reducing the CI of fuels is the best thing we can do in the short term and in the medium term to reduce the overall carbon emissions of the transportation space. So we need to really be thinking about that. The other thing that I found was interesting in the model was um, driving behavior has a huge impact. And the OEMs basically say that once a battery reaches 70% of its original capacity, it's probably not viable for it should be replaced. Um, and that comes in about 1,700 to 2,100 charging cycles. Now, a typical battery vehicle can run 200,000 miles on less than 1,000 charge cycles. So a question was raised um, from a stakeholder uh, last week during a conversation I was having that, John, you know, the BEVs are never going to have that many charge cycles. Well, it depends on how you're driving the vehicle. We all know that if you are heavy on the gas at a, at the green light, heavy on the brakes at a red light, your fuel efficiency and your combustion engine is compromised. You're not going to get the most efficient performance out of your vehicle. Same with an electric vehicle. If you are taking advantage of the acceleration um, benefits of an electric vehicle, which are fantastic, it's a lot of fun, you're going to compromise your range. Because you're going to have to recharge your battery more frequently because you're not going to get the same miles per kilowatt hour that you would if you were driving it gently. And you see here from one of the studies that Ricardo uh, reviewed that the driving range can be compromised by as much as 50% depending on how you drive. That's going to contribute to how many, how often you need to recharge your battery and how many cycles you're going to be going through and could result in a need to replace your battery more frequently. Now, what does that do to overall carbon emissions? It clearly has an impact because you're using more energy. It also affects your overall cost of ownership. And that was the other thing we wanted to understand because the fuel sensitivity believes real strongly that any policy, any program, any effort to reduce, to reduce emissions, improve environmental performance, if it puts an undue financial burden on consumers, it's likely going to fail. So we want to understand the overall cost implications between a combustion engine vehicle hybrid and a battery electric vehicle. And so from the literature review, we came up with this kind of uh, summary of total cost of ownership over 10 years. Now, unless you're kind of a nerd like I am, you're probably not doing a total cost of ownership calculation on a new vehicle purchase. Most consumers aren't going to do that. They're going to be calculating, can I afford the monthly payments? How much is it going to cost me to maintain and operate? What's the residual value at the end of life, possibly? Um, but looking at the total cost of ownership and the way Ricardo broke this down, I think is fantastic because you see capital cost, so that's the purchase price, how much cost to insure, not a whole lot of difference. What's the fuel delta? And there was a question submitted ahead of time that hopefully Ruth can talk to about, did we take in consideration what the different costs of uh, charging at a DC fast charger compared to charging in a home? Um, and clearly we did this during a stable time of the gasoline market. I believe those fuel costs for the ICE vehicle are much higher now than they were even two months ago. So there's a ton of variability in here, but this gives you a breakdown of where the costs are and where the benefits are. On this average, the battery electric vehicle comes out about 9% less expensive to own over 10 years than the internal combustion engine vehicle. Now, you have to add in there the charging time and time value to the consumer. All those things come into place. 
um, how much charging infrastructure is available, when they're going to charge, how long they have to spend charging their vehicle, that all comes up. But this TCO assumes no tax credits and incentives and assumes you're replacing the battery once over the 10-year life of the vehicle and it's still coming out at a lower cost. I think it's really important to note that on all the emissions charts I showed, hybrid electric vehicles kind of split the difference between the battery electric vehicle and the combustion engine vehicle on emissions. It also comes in at the lowest cost to own. So there are a variety of options that can come out of this. You know, how fast you need to reduce carbon emissions? Where can we reduce carbon emissions most effectively? What technologies of vehicle uh, structure are going to benefit the environment and the consumer the most? And in some circumstances, the BEV makes the most sense for emissions and cost. Some circumstances, the internal combustion engine vehicle might make more sense for cost and, the, and overall performance. In almost all circumstances, the hybrid electric vehicle seems to be a, a good option for reducing emissions and delivering value to the consumer. So there's a lot of takeaways from this. And I've got one more slide, then we'll open it up to questions. Um, the key takeaways I have from this study are that, that you know, on average, BEVs are less carbon intense, but there's a lot of variability. And optimizing our geographic deployment to enhance the uh, contributions to carbon mitigation, the battery of the vehicles, is going to go a long way to achieving emissions reduction goals and providing value to the consumer. We have to also start explaining and teaching consumers that the way they drive has a huge impact on not just emissions, but also total cost of ownership. If they're going to be extremely aggressive with their battery electric vehicle, they're probably going to have to replace the battery or somebody in the life of that vehicle is going to have to replace the battery at some point, and that adds a little more cost to it. Um, to reduce carbon intensity of transportation, we need to focus on electricity generation and liquid fuels. Um, if we can reduce the carbon intensity of liquid fuels, the legacy fleet will start contributing to carbon mitigation now. And new to market combustion engine vehicles will start contributing to carbon mitigation now um, while EVs are coming on and filling in those areas where it makes the most sense to do so. The resulting data on hybrids, and I've mentioned this on the last slide, is quite interesting because they are lower cost uh, to own, they are lower carbon emissions than combustion engine vehicles, and in some circumstances, lower than battery electric vehicles. Um, they don't require any infrastructure, they don't require consumer behavior to change. And so how do we leverage hybrid technology? And, you know, last year, hybrids hit 6% of sales, highest uh, percentage of market they've ever had. How do we leverage that? How do we take advantage of that? We have to get out of this idea that decarbonization equals electrification. The goal is reduce carbon. It's not to push a technology. The goal should be to reduce carbon, not, not push a technology. We need to leverage all of our resources. And how do we take advantage of the options we have available to us? Um, and then finally, that driving behavior is important. You know, we all learned when we were growing up, you know, you, you're a responsible driver, you're supposed to take care of, and then we get behind the wheel of our cars and we kind of do what we want to do. Um, but if we're serious about reducing costs, reducing emissions, trying to create environments where driving responsibly, um, driving environmentally responsibly makes a lot of sense. That goes into also some street planning and community planning. I live in an area where I've got about four lights between my house and the interstate, and I constantly hit three of the four almost every single day. Is that the most efficient planning and sequencing of lights on that roadway? Is there another way to enhance efficiency? So driving behavior, uh, congestion mitigation, all those things play into this and tie into the total life cycle assessment. And those things need to be brought into the discussion as well. Um, so that was a, like I said, I wanted to give a high level overview of the research and the results from our perspective. Again, Ruth is with us now and she can fill in and answer some questions if you have some that I'm not able to answer. Um, and with that, Jeff, I'll turn it back over to you to see if we have any questions. Thanks, John. Um, yeah, we've got several questions coming in. I see Ruth, you're you're tackling some of them, so already, and I've 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 tried myself. So um, let's go ahead and and see which ones come up. Um, I'm going to go through them here. One one question that that came out had to do with one of the metrics as far as measuring total cost of ownership. James Cater was asking what what price did we use on on battery replacement in our model. Ruth, do you have that at your fingertips? Um, I don't have it at my fingertips, but I can send that as part of the response because I know it's something we've okay. looked at. 
Okay. Yep. Yep. I know it's definitely in there, um, buried in the appendix somewhere. So, um, <laughs> James, we'll, 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 again, we're going to respond to the questions in the follow up email next week for everybody. So, if we don't get to yours um, right now, uh, we're, you know, we'll, uh, we'll tackle it later. Um, let's see. So the, the study is assuming a 200,000 mile uh, life of the vehicle. And the, the question is, are you assuming 10 year vehicle life? Um, because if you are basically, why bother changing the battery? Because 70% of capacity is still good for most owners after 10 years. Um, any, any thoughts? Any thoughts on on that? And, and some and related to that is the the battery choice was a 24 kilowatt battery, and in the larger battery vehicle batteries uh, should be able to go beyond 200,000 miles. So um, without hitting that 70 percent uh, reduction in, in uh, available charge. So I think I think that describe that question is really both of those questions are surrounding. You know what? You know how did how did we approach the vehicle used? And I don't think we touched on the fact that that we we, we didn't really focus on light duty vehicles. We were really looking at the larger SUVs in this study, which is pretty important as well. Um, what do you think, Ruth? Yeah. So I mean, I think that that broadly all of these things are are in flux in the market at the moment so what the the final size of a battery is going to be and whether the size that is written on the battery is actually the size of the battery capacity um that the OEM puts in is is another you know thing that I think is is open um in this case you know we we chose specific um set points that the issue with LCA is that you can change everything and everything changes. Um, you have to sort of put a line in the sand that this is this is what you're going to assume for this one item. So we assume that the 200,000 miles, whether it's 180,000, whether it's you know 210,000, I think that that even the amount that people use their vehicles is changing with with vehicle availability as well as with um, how repairable vehicles are. Um, and how durable vehicles are. So I think that that with respect to changing battery size, um, yes, if you increase the battery size, you increase the capacity of the vehicle, but the implication would be that as you drive a vehicle with a larger battery, you're gonna need more range. Um, in this case, the battery was sized to the range we were looking at. Uh, so there's still the risk that that a battery for an application um, at at a 2,000 200,000 mile radius is going to be um, is going to be sort of at its end of life. Yeah, and in the study, I didn't show it in the presentation, Jeff, but in the study there is a sensitivity analysis for uh, battery range, battery density, battery chemistry. Um, not a huge bunch of, about not a huge degree of variability. Now, we start getting a range. You do get some carbon variability to that. Um, I didn't focus on that because it wasn't uh, the key takeaway from my perspective, but that is in there. I think on the first question, the 200,000 mile 10 year, I think the 10 year total cost of ownership was because that's what the literature that was informing that analysis provided, and the 200,000 miles for carbon. So, we are looking at the 200,000 mile life expectancy for the carbon emission side and then a 10 year total cost of ownership for owners for the cost. Yeah. Okay. And I think in terms of battery replacement, um, I, I'll find the number that we used in the study, but that's another thing that that is very much um, in flux at the moment. We know that many OEMs are choosing to use a, a remanufacturing strategy instead of a, a pure battery replacement strategy. So, you know, you wouldn't put a brand new battery in a 10 year old vehicle. You would put a, a refurbished or remanufactured battery in that vehicle. So the replacement would be would be less, um, but it is still costly. So I think that that we made an assumption, but I would say that that's something that that hasn't been established as a firm, clear this is what the price of a battery is going to be once this technology is at any kind of scale. I think there's also the question of 
will people actually replace the battery? So the OEM yeah. says at 70%, we should replace the battery. That doesn't mean the vehicle owner is going to do that. And if it's an eight to $10,000 replacement, they may just say, okay, I'm going to get 30% less range on a full charge. Then we've had conversations subsequent to publication of this is, what does the used car market look like? And if the first owner is going to get to say 75% of battery capacity, and then they shift it to the used car market, what does that do to residual values? What does that do to that total cost of ownership if that's the model? Um, are the used car purchasers just going to accept a vehicle with 30% less mile range, or are they going to invest and replace the battery? And does that change the, the value? So the TCO is, again, this is a benchmark. And to Ruth's point, you can change all the variables that go into the total cost of ownership, change all the variables that go into LCA and come out completely different out, outputs. Um, but we're starting to we use this as kind of the fulcrum to start seeing what the range might look like based upon different assumptions. Yeah, it, it, the consumer is going to be on a huge learning curve in that used yep. car market. And, and so um, I'm sure we're going to see more information as the market grows. I, I, another question or comment um, has to do with, and I know, and I bring this up because the Fuels Institute is kind of moving into this space, and that is, you know, uh, and again, this is a this is a snapshot in time report. Uh, it's not, it's not really forward looking, and we realize that that there are efficiencies in ICE vehicles that are that we're still working on, new technologies um, that can reduce miles per gallon, which of course is linearly related to the, your CO2 equivalents. Um, and so, so we are looking into that right now. John, do you want to add anything to what we're doing in that space? Yeah, I think, you know, this study is funny. We did this study and then while we were reviewing it and everything, it prompted us to commission three new studies, just white papers to kind of take a look at a couple areas. One being, I keep hearing there's no more research being done on combustion engine vehicles. And that bothers me tremendously because we're going to be selling combustion to vehicles for decades. And what does that mean? So we have a paper that's uh, getting ready, to, that's still in review process, that's looking at what research is being done on combustion engines to improve efficiency. What research is being done on liquid fuels to improve the carbon intensity of those options? Because we can't ignore it. And one of the things that uh, the Fuels Institute took from this paper is we need to be much more assertive that we can't just sit back and wait for the market to transition to new technology. We have a responsibility to address combustion engine and liquid fuels now, and we can't ignore that. We can't throw all the research attention in a new direction when the, you know, right now 99% of vehicles on the road in the United States burn liquid fuel. You know, we can't ignore that. So we've got a paper coming out on that. We've got a paper coming out on biofuels. Um, I mentioned that earlier when I talked about the carbon capture sequestration analysis. Um, and a few other things coming out too, because we have to be very specific and strategic about how we do this. Yeah, we're going to be very busy. Uh, Ruth, I got a good question here from Alan Arati. Uh, could you expand a little bit more on what went into that that the the EV side of the equation on mining? And we we hear a lot about oh. mining operations and rare earth minerals and and what have you. Can you? Yeah. Yeah, I saw that question. Um, yeah, so so I think that from from the perspective of um, of the carbon footprint of lithium and cobalt and all you know all of those um, materials that that are being viewed as critical supply chain elements on batteries, um, we assumed a current state on that. I think that if you look at things like you know, the impact of deforestation for mining, that's not included in this. This isn't like a complete view of resource extraction over the next, um, you know, 50 years. I think that there is, there is some, we assume it stays the same. Now, you know, that's certainly something that would be interesting to study. And I think that it would um, change the carbon footprint of those technologies. But um, I think that it was it was sort of outside of the bounds of what we were looking at here. Yeah, and one of the things we were, we were working on this in the uh, development scope of work, our stakeholder said, hold on, we have to put limits on what we try to research here. <laughs> we can't take, <laughs> especially when we start talking about cost, you can't take into consideration every single cost that might come in the equation. You can't take into consideration every evolution. Now, in the literature review section of the report, <clears throat> there is analysis of other research has been done 
for example, the greening of the grid, how are we how are we progressing there? I think ICCT did a great paper on that to see, you know, what where are we going with grid improvement on carbon intensity? How does that reflect to LCA? Um, so that's all in there. That's in there as well. Um, but at some point, you got to put uh, boundaries on the research you do. And uh, Ruth coached us quite a bit on that, that we could still be doing the analysis. <laughs> Instead of talking about the report, we could still be doing the analysis and get paralyzed with that. Yeah. And that's and and there, there's another question um, that kind of falls into that category. You know, you've got a finite number of resources to go go into research, and and as time as technology is changing so quickly, you know, we we don't have time to do a, a two year study, right? We want to start and complete a study within six months because policies are changing, technology is changing. We got to stay ahead of the curve as much as we can. And so one of the questions was, you know, why didn't we look at higher blends of ethanol? You know. A, you know, greater than E30 in this study. Um, my response is I look at market penetration and I look at a, a product viability. And and I'm sure I'll get crucified by some on that. For, for, <laughs> well, you know, I mean, it's true. I mean, you go above E15, you have a limited number of vehicles that are authorized to run on that fuel, that are calibrated designed around that fuel. Now, you're going to have stakeholders say, well, I've been running E30 in my 1985, blah, 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 for years, no problem. And that's great anecdotal information. But from a regulatory, uh, official, legal liability perspective, you need a specially formulated vehicle to run on something higher than E15. So uh, we're really looking at the universe of the transportation sector. Um, and then this wasn't designed to really kind of identify what switches in fuel availability and engine technology need to be contemplated to reach certain objectives. That's great. Um, Mark, Mark, Mark Larson uh, asks a, a good question here regarding uh, what are utilities doing you know, in the background because of the impact. So he says the fuel cost variable was substantial. Utilities are scrambling to assess capacity sustainability with EV growth. Utilities are also initiating peak demand and other behind the meter assessments, thus increasing fuel cost. How is that factored in, please? So again, I think the question is kind of forward looking, whereas, you know, but uh, any thoughts on, on, on that? I think that question is also to me linked to, um, there's a previous question about whether or not any um, any road taxes applied to yeah. alternative fuels would also be included. Um, and I would say that that again, this is one of those areas where um, the study was focused more on the vehicle side and on the vehicle technology than on the complete variability on the fuel side. So we started with with today's grid today's prices as a baseline and looked at some variability in that within the the current forecasts but we didn't you know do a a, a deep dive into you know what's going to happen in utility markets um as a result of this i think this is this is the the this is the problem that my analysts have with lca and i think all of us have with lca is that you know you dig into one piece of the problem and it just opens up 35 other pieces of the problem <laughs> that you want to dig into. Um, and, and these are all things that that I would be fascinated to study, but I think we had to limit it um, on this to sort of, you know, what we could what we could estimate based on the information that we have on electricity prices today. Yeah, you know, and Mark, he raises a great point that the the retail market for electricity for charging is completely undefined. It is so nascent and so early on that we really don't understand how it's going to evolve. We know that the rate structure of the utility sector is not really designed to support this type of transaction element. Um, we've had conversations with utilities about explaining the competitive structure of the retail fuel market and how it does not necessarily translate to the electricity market where you have designated service territories and different rate setting practices <clears throat> at some point for this to become a very viable market transparency and competition at the electricity charging port is going to have to develop uh, i think it's way too early to project what that's going to look like but hopefully over the next five to ten years as electric vehicles gain more market share and the infrastructure builds out that type of consumer facing transparency and competition for the best value will materialize. Okay. 
jumping back to the total cost of ownership, um, there, there's a question in here on the variable. We, we, we had a little bucket in there for like ancillary costs. Um, uh, you know, a, a lot of states are, are jacking up EV registration fees to make up for road use tax. And, and so, I mean, I mean, we, we see it where I live. Um, so I know that that is built in there. Uh, did, did, did that little bucket where we have like those ancillary costs, does that include any, any, um, evaluation of insurability of the vehicle? Are, 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 is it costing more to insure an EV versus ICE? And, and I think, I think people, again, put out anecdotal information on which one is riskier to own, and I don't think it's fully known yet. And so, of course, insurance companies typically lean towards the more conservative, right? We're not sure about it. You're going to pay more insurance for it. Or, hey, Ruth, was there, was there anything in the report in TCO regarding insurability? Um, so, so we do have some information on sort of in insurance costs across vehicles, but we're Right now, we're not seeing um, electrification as being the only factor. There's there's a lot of things that, that play into it. Um, I think the addition of ADAS systems um, and a lot of sensor technology in the crash zones on vehicles, as well as the um, the advancement of headlights, also have an impact. Um, I mean, just just to give you an example, we did another project where we're doing cost analysis on the essentially the front bumper and, and headlights on a vehicle and the whole assembly with all the sensors was $15,000. So, I mean, if if you crunched up the front end of your car, that's a $15,000 in parts repair. Um, I think all of these things have an impact. Uh, there's also the fact that a lot of the um, electric vehicles right now tend towards that, you know, high zero to 60, high, you know, that they're meant to be fun and sporty. Um, and so the question is, are they more expensive from an insurance perspective because they're fun and sporty and people are driving them strangely? Or um, is it is it truly that it's something to do with the electrification? And I think all of that, um, there are a lot of insurance companies right now trying to, to figure out exactly what to do with that. Yeah. So, and, and a, a lot of things are going to roll into that, right? Because you've mm -hmm. got your autonomous aspect of the vehicle and an auto braking uh, mm -hmm. things. Um, a good question from Pat McDuff here that, and we and I, we, we talk so much about GHG and CO2 equivalents, right? I mean, that's what the majority of people talk about um, because of climate discussions. You know, the, the, the other piece of the puzzle, of course, are criteria pollutants, uh, if you're building out your ESG plan, you are being asked to, you might be getting asked to report on air quality or criteria pollutants such as NOx. And so I know we're going to be jumping into this a lot because we've got a whole new biofuels uh, committee started at Fuels Institute. And when we start talking about uh, renewable diesel or biodiesel, what's the potential of, of NOx actually going up instead of being reduced? And, and, it, and that's been batted around a lot lately. I don't know that we've got an answer um, for that question right now, other than the fact that this report did not look at criteria pollutants um, su such as NOx and, and those those other ancillary emission outputs. So I, I think it's something to keep in mind, especially with EPAs. Uh, well, wait a second. It was CARB's recent low, their low emission diesel study. Um, and so we're we're going to have to keep one eye on what's going on over there, but I will say that I, I, this study was not really looking at that. Um, what else do we have here? Oh, I can't read that question. <laughs> <laughs> you guys, let's see. Uh, Ruth, if you see any that jump out at you that you're itching to answer, please let me know. Um, I think there is a question of why aren't there significant differences between NMC and LFP? Oh, yeah. um, and I think that that we've been seeing, you know, even since we've done this study, improvements in um, in LFP. And so we we were sort of working on what what's average and in vehicles today. 
um, versus what's coming. Um, it, it, and so I'm, I think that I'm that's sorry. I'm sorry, Ruth. Could you give some background information for those that aren't, aren't aware of what those acronyms stand for? Yeah, those those are those are chemistry um, in lithium ion batteries. So it's it's basically uh, um, there are two different technologies used in vehicle batteries. Um, yeah, going into exactly what they are is probably not going to be less confusing, but um, particularly LFP is is sort of one of the areas where there's been a lot of work um, done of late. So that's sort of where where um, you're seeing improvements in longevity um, and to some degree in um, in battery performance. Uh, so I think that that, you know, there's. I think that there have been improvements since we actually did the study. And when we did the study, we used what was the current state. And that's yeah. the thing with batteries, right? Six months makes a difference. I mean, three months makes a difference. It, the, the market is changing so quickly. Um, you know, I think we see, and, and it's a problem for OEMs because even some of them who have, you know, who are in the process of PPAPing vehicles are looking at chemistry changes you know, six months, eight months, 10 months down the road, um, which is a, a crazy cycle of change for an OEM. It's going to be, it's, uh, like we said earlier too, I mean, it, the idea of needing to get research out quickly and timely, and, and that's one of the primary drivers right there, is just the technology changes so quickly. And then of course, there's going to be the impacts on on sourcing, sourcing the materials. Um, you know, as we look at doing more of that in the U.S., uh, so you know, what's that going to do for the the changing of those technologies? Um, I think we I think we captured I think we captured all the questions. Um, um, there's one last one, I guess. Are the assumptions of the simulation detailed in the study? Um, and and yes, they are. If there's anything that that you don't see there, um, having read the complete study that you you want further information on, please feel free to reach out um, to John or to myself, and you know we'll do what we can to get you that information. Yeah. The goal of this is not to hide anything. It's to be very transparent about you know what our our um, assumptions were. Yeah. Uh, and it, Tom Leone asked asked another question kind of regarding, you know, what, what size vehicle were we studying? Again, we were looking more towards the SUV. And of course, there is there's the new Ford study that came out on pickup trucks, which is pretty fascinating as well. Um, so we're going to start we're going to start looking at uh, even beyond the pickup trucks and, and what's the life cycle analysis on, you know, up to a class eight truck. You know, um, and then eventually I got to imagine we're going to we should be looking at on road versus or, or off road vehicles as well for heavy duty. We know Cummins is making a lot of strides in that in that realm. So. Um, so, yeah, I. I think the bottom line for me on this is we have to keep asking the questions. All the questions brought to this uh, webinar were completely appropriate because we need to be asking the questions. You can't take anything just as that's the final result. That's the end of the story. That's the ultimate answer. There is no answer <laughs> to the, all the questions. There are just variabilities and there's options and there's choices and there's directions we need to be thinking about. So um, my encouragement is to always question what you're reading, always question what you're hearing, always ask the questions because only by asking the questions can we actually get to decisions that make sense. Perfect. Perfect way to end an amazing webinar. And thanks, thanks everybody for for joining. Um, is there is there anything else? I know we have we have our annual event in May in Indianapolis coming up. We're gonna we're gonna be convening our board of advisors. We encourage anybody that's interested to learn more about the Fuels Institute uh, and all the dynamics involved in it, all of our peer review process, everything that goes into our our, our research. Uh, please consider attending that um, coming up. 
And if you if you want more information on it, just reach out to me, Jeff Hovey, and uh, and I'll make sure I get that that information out to you. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you very much.